All right, it is two, uh, so we'll get started. Just a re as a reminder, um, no lecture on Wednesday. So this will be the only lecture we have for this week. So I'm just gonna jump right into it. There will be homework for this lecture that's due on Sunday like normal. So there'll only be uh, one part for the homework. So, on Friday, we were talking about our lysozyme um, mechanism and we just started talking about the active site, binding our substrate. Um, and so remember the important thing here is that we're binding six sugars um, and we're cutting between sugar D and E. And the way that we um, help speed this cup uh, cut up is that sugar D is in a very unfavorable half chair conformation. And that torsion is really what is speeding up this reaction and allowing us to make the cut. Now, we're gonna look at the mechanism of lysozyme, um, but to better understand the mechanism, we're first going to look at how we make a acid catalyzed cut or hydrolysis um, non-enzymatically. All right, and so what we're doing here is we're doing acid catalyzed hydrolysis. So here we have just our setup where we have an uh, acetal plus an acid. And what's going to happen is that we are going to protonate this oxygen. That, pro that, that oxygen becomes protonated and it has three bonds to it which is incredibly unfavorable for an oxygen. Um, this oxygen has now become positively charged. Oxygen is a very electronegative um, atom. So to have an oxygen be positively charged is just very energetically unfavorable. And the oxygen wants to alleviate that as much as possible. And for that to happen, the ROH group is going to be uh, removed um, so that our oxygen now has two bonds again and it's happy. So this group, these are the same group. So that once we protonate the oxygen, that group can leave. And we're left with a uh, intermediate carbocation. Um, you might have talked about carbocations in organic, I'm not sure, but a carbocation uh, is basically a positively charged ca uh, carbon. Uh, they don't last very long, but they do exist, right? And so here's our two resonance structures. One, we have the um, positive charge on the oxygen. The other one, we have the positive charge on the carbon. And the right form probably exists. Um, uh, it's probably more prevalent um, than the left form just because oxygen does not want to be positively charged. Oxygen wants to be negatively charged. So our carbon here is probably going to be um, more positively charged than our oxygen. This intermediate has a name. This is called ox oxynonium ion. And remember, since this is our intermediate, this is what the enzyme will try to bind to. Right? Because getting to this intermediate, that's the slowest step, right? When we're looking at our energy diagram again, right, the intermediate transition state is right there. Right, it's at the top of our hill, our transition state. So our enzyme is gonna try and make that transition state as favorable as possible. So that's what we're gonna be on the lookout for when we look at this mechanism. And to finish off this reaction, um, an OH group will come in, or water will come in rather, lose a proton and become an OH group. So this is really, this whole mechanism so acetal to a hemiacetal reaction. 
And we've seen this already, this, this type of reaction, when we've looked at sugar cyclization. Um, we went from acetal to hemiacetal there. Here, to break a, a glycosidic bond, we're doing the same thing, where this R group in the top here, this would be our other sugar, right? So you can say this is sugar one, this R group is other sugar or sugar two. And remember, that's what we're really cutting. So again, I know this slide, very dense, a lot of information. Um, any questions about any of the key points I uh, touched on there before we look at the actual uh, mechanism of lysozyme? How often does one on the left happen? I do not have percentages. Um, so I, anything I say would be a guess. But just going on my chemical intuition, intuition I'd probably say less than 10% of the time. And remember, when we talk about resonance structures, um, even though we draw two different structures, in reality, it's just one structure and they take on characteristics of both structures. So what that means is that the carbon is, has more positive charge than the oxygen, but it's not a complete single bond like we see here. It's not 100% it's not that structure. But yeah, I, I don't know what percent characteristics they are. They are. Now let's look at that same mechanism, but now with our enzyme. So here we have our two sugars and the most important players for this are glutamic acid, 35, and aspartic acid, 52. And something that should jump out for you right at the start, if you remember your amino acids, is that glutamic acid is protonated. Up to this point in the class, we have never talked about a protonated glutamic acid. Um, we've always said that, you know, unless we're at a pH of like one, glutamic acid is always negatively charged. Here, lysozyme has a um, positive or a protonated glutamic acid. And that's going to be our acid for this reaction, right? So it's going to, let me get rid of that circle now. The hydrogen from our glutamic acid, that's what's going to be attaching to our oxygen in our glycosidic bond here. So like the last mechanism, right, where, where we just saw, um, once we have our oxygen becoming protonated here, it will become positively charged and oxygen does not want to do that. So to prevent being positively charged, it's gonna break its glycosidic bond right there. And sugar E now leaves. However, we're not done yet. And the reason we're not done is because our glutamic acid is negatively charged. And also our sugar is a carbocation. So we need to fix both of these things. We need to get our proton dot back from back to glutamic acid. And we also need to take care of this positively charged cat carbocation. Remember, this oxonium ion is our transition state. And so this is the hardest state to get to as well. And so to lower the energy of the transition state, we have our negatively charged aspartic acid ready to go. Right? So as soon as that carbocation forms, we have a negative oxygen just ready to go and interact with that positive car carbon, uh, 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 carbon. And what we have happen is actually covalent catalysis. We bind that intermediate state to our enzyme to create a covalent intermediate. 
So that is the strategy lysozyme use, uses to speed up this reaction. We have a negative oxygen from aspartic acid to be right near the carbon. And then as soon as our carbon becomes comes a carbocation, we bind that through a covalent bond. So now we have our sugar bound to our enzyme. We have to get rid of that. And so the way we're gonna get rid of that is just like the previous mechanism where we saw water come in. So water is gonna come into the binding pocket. The oxygen of water is gonna attack our carbon this will release our aspartic acid, freeing it up. And as in the last mechanism we saw, when water attacks, it's going to lose a proton. Well, that proton goes right to glutamic acid. So we let go of our other sugar now because we no longer have a carbocation. And we have restored our binding pocket because remember, for every time, every time you do a mechanism, you always have to get your enzyme back to where it started, right? If we never restored that glutamic acid to be neutral again or to have that proton, we wouldn't be able to cut another glycosidic bond. We would be one and done not a very efficient use of your resources for an enzyme. So an enzyme has to cut many times. All right, so with, with our mechanism out there, and now that I've gone step by step, is there any questions people have about that mechanism or any questions about the logic, the biochemical logic of how that mechanism works or any other questions? Uh, dealing with lysosome. All right, if, oh, looks like we do. Um, if this, so a question, would you want us to draw any of this or just know the overall steps? I think what you should do to study for this is to try and draw it from memory. Because if you can draw it from memory, any questions I can ask about this mechanism, you know. So on the test, I can't actually have you draw it because um, the test is probably, because drawing online, that just brings up a lot of, a lot of issues, right? Um, but I highly suggest when you get to this in your review, cover up that picture, cover up the explanations, see if you can draw all the arrow movements. If you can, you, you will have this mechanism mastered and you will have this whole topic of lysozyme mastered. And, uh, so yeah, short answer, no, I won't ask you to draw this. Long answer, I think you should practice drawing this to get that, um, um, to learn it better. Any other questions? All right, so let me clear that. Um, so for the sake of time, um, I'm gonna be answering some of these questions because we have a whole nother lecture to get to. But the question here is what would happen if we change our aspartic acid in our, our glutamic acid to aspartic acid and our aspartic acid to glutamic acid. So in our mechanism that we just covered, right? The glutamic acid and aspartic acid, these are the ones I'm talking about and they're the main players of our uh, mechanism. Let's just say I swapped them using mutagenesis where I made an enzyme that has spark acid at position 35 and glutamic acid at position 52. And the question is, what would happen? And so what would happen is that the activity would most certainly go down. 
That's not how you spell activity, but it's close enough. There's a C in there. The activity was certainly go down. Um, because even though they're both negatively charged, uh, both negatively charged normally, one has two carbons, right? The other one has three carbons, right? So this is spark acid, and this is glutamic acid. And just one carbon might not seem like a big deal, but the active site has been um, formed over millions of years, you know, hundreds of millions of years, if not billions of years, to be precise, in that the addition of one methyl and the subtraction of another methyl, and remember, when I say methyl, I'm just basically meaning that you will change the locate, you will change the distance between the enzyme and the substrate. Enzyme and substrate. Which would overall most likely lower the activity of the enzyme. Your enzyme is no longer good at cutting. And that's just because you slightly um, modify the side chains. Um, it's possible this enzyme would not work at all. It's possible doing that change would break it, but it would, in all honesty, it would probably still work. It would just be a lot slower. Um, it won't be efficient at all. So any questions about that idea, that explanation, lysozyme? All right, so question two, our glutamic acid is surrounded by a bunch of hydrophobic amino acids. And I didn't show this in the picture in the active site, even though there's only two amino acids that I show, in reality, it's just surrounded by amino acids, right? And by having glutamic acid being surrounded by hydrophobic amino acids, the pKa is raised to 6.2. Why is this important? So this is like a great example of a question that you know really tests your understanding of a mechanism, not just pure memorization of how the mechanism works, but a, a fundamental understanding of the biochemical properties of the, of the uh, enzyme. And the reason why this is important is that glue donates a proton. That's step one, uh, two sugar. So it needs to be protonated to do that. You know, normally the pKa of glutamic acid, what is that, like 3.75? And the pH of a cell is roughly seven, right? And so, Normally, there's roughly a 0% chance to be protonated, right? If, if that glue had the normal pK of 3.75, if I had a million glutamic acids, maybe one would be protonated at a pH of 7, maybe. Probably not, but maybe. So there's roughly a 0% chance he'll be protonated. However, if my pKa is 6.2, you know, that's roughly a 30% chance to be protonated normally. And as we saw in the mechanism, right, that water is always coming in to protonate that glutamic acid. Um, so this, this changing of the pKa is fundamental for this mechanism to work. And so I, I have a, another question that I'm actually going to see if anyone can will uh, put forth a theory. Um, the other amino acid that we saw that has a pK of around six is histidine. So 
So does anyone know or want to put a guess of why lysozyme doesn't just use histidine instead of glutamic acid? There's a good critical thinking question for you. Pure chance and evolution? Maybe. Uh, is it because it can be used as an acid and base and maybe wouldn't be able to control which one it acts as? Maybe. I actually have no idea. Um, I have not actually looked up that question ever. I've never thought about that question until right now. So here's a little holiday bonus for you at home or those of you watching later on YouTube. If you can find because I, I kind of just did a little, little Googling and I know there's info out there. If you can tell me what pe why people think that glue is used instead of histidine, I will give anyone who sends me that information plus their resource a little bit of extra credit. I don't know how much. And I'll say, you know, send that to me before Monday. because I don't know the answer to that. I think that might be just, if you have time, if you're Zooming your family or whatever, or, or if you have a small family gathering and, and you wanna be alone, why not open up your phone and type in why, why not use histidine in the active side? Because honestly, I do not know the answer. My guess would be due to evolution, um, just it, the glutamic acid works so well with everything else in there that, um, um, it's the most efficient way to do it. Why? I don't know. Name me histine, um, put forth. Um, like Annette said, maybe it's not, it's not, histine is not as good as a control. Would you want us to send in like a paragraph what we find? Yeah, just type up like a paragraph or two of like a summary of what you can find. And uh, just just put the source you got it from. That's all I need. I don't need like pages upon pages. I'm just just like half a page, a couple paragraphs, something like that. That's all I need. All right. Any questions? Roughly half a page, more than a sentence. And please don't send me like six pages because I will not read them all. Just kidding, if you send me six pages, I probably will read them all because I would be interested to know why it took six pages to say that. Maybe there's a lot of research out there on this. Anywho, moving on. So, Another question that gets just at active sites and enzymes in general. Now, moving away from the aspartic acid and glutamic acids that we talked about, if we look at aspartic acid 101 and arginine 114, if we try to mutate those away, that is, if we try to change those into other amino acids, um, the catalysis the mechanism, the rate of this enzyme goes down drastically, even though they are not close to the active site. So the question is, if I mutate ASP or ARG to alanine, the overall shape of our enzyme doesn't change, but the activity goes down. An explanation for that. Well, Let's, this is the logic that I would think. Um, actually, I'm gonna give, take, take a minute to like think about it. You don't have to answer, but I do want you to actually like think about it. get an idea before I just blurt out the answer. Because uh, if I just blurt it out, I'm missing an opportunity to teach. So take a minute and just 
see if you can think of why activity would go down. Then I'll tell you the logic of how I would think about this. I'll be back with you in a minute. All right, so let's think about this logic. So I'm going from D101 to A101. If you're ever reading like papers or have ever seen this notation, this means I mutated a spark acid at position 101 to alanine or R114 to L114. All right, so some clues here. We do not touch ter a tertiary structure. What that tells you is that these amino acids aren't interacting with uh, the protein all that much. They aren't interacting with the other amino acids in the protein. Because if you did this mutation and you saw a change in the tertiary structure, that, may, that means these, uh, the side chains were very important in some type of connection to hold this protein together. But we don't see that. We see we mutate an alanine, it looks the same. But the activity goes down. What this tells me is that it was interacting with the substrate. It was probably interacting with the substrate somehow, right? Now we have to try and understand how it was interacting with the substrate. So from there, once you have that basic idea down, let's look at the amino acids themselves. The spark acid is negatively charged. Arginine is positively charged. Alanine is neutral, it's just a CH3. What that should tell you is that having a charged side chain at that position is very important. And when you go and look at the structure, what you'll see is that these amino acids are hydrogen bonding with the substrate. So the answer to this is, and through all, all the pieces, I hope by, by showing you the different pieces of those sentences, how to logic something out like this. Um, I know since you just started only studying biochemistry a couple months ago, um, doing something like this seems very intimidating, um, but it gets easier the more you do it. Um, but we saw it doesn't change structure. Okay, not interacting with the protein all that much. Activity goes down. Okay, so it's either interacting with the active site or the substrate. Look at the structure and we see we were hydrogen bonding with our substrate, holding it in place. So we were holding the substrate in place. But once we go to alanine, alanine can't have a hydrogen bond with the side chain. We lose those interactions. The substrate's not being held in place correctly uh, for the glue and the asp and the active site to work. So since the substrate is moving around more, um, catalyt catalytic activity goes down a lot. Remember, we talked about this on Friday, one way one the major way an enzyme speeds up a reaction is by having the substrate like hold still. We lose that ability when we do this mutation. 
So any questions about that explanation or the logic or how I got there? All right, we will move on. So let's see here. I'm just seeing what we need to do. All right, um, let's talk about the catalytic triad uh, quickly here. Uh, so a bunch of enzymes, oh, we do have a question here. How did I come to the conclusion they're not interacting? because if they were interacting, then the tertiary structure would have changed. Um, by interacting, I mean interacting with like the other amino acids of the protein, right? Because usually if you have like an amino acid that interacts with the rest of the amino acids in that protein, if you mutate that amino acid away, usually the structure changes a lot. Um, but since our structure didn't change, that's how I know, oh, it's probably not interacting with the other amino acids in the enzyme. All right, so trypsin and other proteins, there's a whole class of proteins called serine proteases. And what these serine proteases have in common is what's called the catalytic triad. That is, they have an aspartic acid, a histidine, and a serine. And it's your serine that will be doing the chemistry here. And what these uh, proteins do, anytime you see a serine protease, they basically do the same reaction in that they cut stuff. So we see these for digestion, different developments, uh, blood coagulation, inflammation, many others use the these uh, trypsin enzymes, these catalytic uh, triad enzymes. Um, your most common ones are chymotrypsin, trypsin, and elastic, the most commonly studied that is. And we're gonna look at the mechanism of these catalytic triad enzymes. So these different enzymes react with different substrates. In the substrate they, they bind is determined through what's called the specificity pocket. So chyme, chymotrypsin, binds bulky uh, aromatic side chains. And that's because its pocket is hydrophobic and full of small amino acids. So the hydrophobic and small amino acids. So it allows a big bulky residue to get in there. Um, trypsin binds positively charged, so it has a negatively charged aspartic acid. Elastase binds small hydrophobic um, amino acids, so alanine, glycine, valine. So it has um, hydrophobic amino acids in there as well, but they have bigger side chains. If you notice, the only difference between uh, chymotrypsin and trypsin and in this specificity pocket is amino acid 189. We have a serine in one and aspartic acid in another. But if you just mutate serine to aspartic acid, you don't make trypsin. Uh, you just get a protease that's, that doesn't work very well. What this tells us is that although we know where the specificity pocket is, the, the interactions of that pocket are due to amino acids that are farther away from it, right? So amino acids that may not seem important for the mechanism or for the binding that are away from the binding site, they are providing some kind of structure there that allows the binding. So the important takeaway from that is that, um, that other residues that may not seem important that are farther away, that far away in distance are actually important to enzymes. And you'll see that in enzymes all the time. So specificity pocket is how we bind certain, uh, certain things. Now, yeah, question. 
Has anyone tried to figure out what those residues are? Oh, I'm sure. Um, these enzymes have been studied uh, to death. So um, I'm sure they know all about it. It was probably some poor students whole like, you know, three years of their life just to mutate every residue to glycine and see what happens. So that's exciting. Um, so I think I'm gonna make an executive decision here and we're gonna skip this mechanism. For sake of time, I have more important things I wanna talk about than arrow pushing. Um, so we're gonna skip the actual mechanism, but I do want you to know catalytic triad is uh, asp, hist, and serine. So make sure you know what amino acids make up the catalytic triad. Make sure you know what the specificity pocket is and how we bind things. But we're gonna skip this mechanism for now, oh, for this class. And the other part of the, um, these type of proteins I wanna talk about is called the oxyanion hole, right? So if we would have went over the mechanism, we would have saw this transition state. So, um, so during this, this mechanism, we're cutting a peptide bond. And during, during our cutting, we make this tetrahedral intermediate. which has a negatively charged oxygen. So this is, our, this is our high energy intermediate. And to lower the energy, we have what's called the oxyanion hole. It's a space inside our protein where we have two backbone amides. So these are backbone. We have two backbone amides that are just pointing into an area of the protein. When we make our intermediate, the oxygen naturally goes to where these two amides are pointing, which makes nice hydrogen bonds. The formation of these hydrogen bonds lower the energy of our intermediate and allows our um, reaction to go fast. So make sure you know what the oxyanion hole, what the purpose is. And the purpose is to lower the energy of our intermediate. And it does that by making hydrogen bonds to our tetrahedral intermediate stage. Um, or, or yeah, our tetrahedral intermediate. So any questions about like since we skipped the slide, like questions about like what information I want you to um, uh, to be ready for. The oxyanion hole, what it does is it lowers the energy of the tetrahedral intermediate by forming hydrogen bonds. That's a one sentence explanation of what a oxyanion hole is. Could I repeat one more time what we should know? You should know what the purpose of the oxyanion hole is. You should know what makes up the catalytic triad. You should know what uh, catalytic tri triad uh, enzymes generally do. Um, they generally cut um, they generally cut things. So usually they will cut um, peptide backbones. And you should know about the specificity pocket. The only thing I don't need you to know is the actual mechanism. I guess it would have been easier to just say that. All right, so moving on. Um, so we're going to skip this as well, because I, I, I want to get to at least some of the um, next uh, slide. So we can skip the idea of proteolytic enzymes. And I'm going to 
get up our next slide here because the next slide is um, any of you who take like med school tests or dentistry or vets, there's a chance you would see this stuff. So I really need to get to it before the end of the semester. And that is kinetics. Um, kinetics is basically reaction speed. And for enzymes, we use basically Michaela's Menten kinetics. Uh, Michaela's Menten are the names of the people who really made this popular and formalized the paper on it. Um, and I don't, I'm not going to go through the derivation here in class. Uh, did that in the video. So if you're really interested in the derivation, if you're really interested in math, it's there for you. What I need you to know is this equation. And let's see what this equation says. This equation says, well, first off, let's go to the left equation. The left equation at the top there is our fundamental model for how any enzyme works. Um, this is simplified. Not all enzymes follow this, but it's, it's a good enough approximation. And the idea here is that our enzyme and our substrate can bind, and they'll form an enzyme substrate complex. They do so with some speed. So this is like a reaction speed that we call K1. This enzyme substrate complex can also break apart back to free enzyme and free substrate. This is K minus one. No blood coagulation cascade. Nope, that's very cool. But for the sake of time, this is, uh, we need to move on to kinetics. Right, so enzyme plus substrate make enzyme substrate complex. It has a speed to make it, has a speed to break apart. There's a, another speed called K2 where you form product plus enzyme. So that's the overall uh, reaction that we're gonna be thinking about when it comes to uh, kinetics, to enzymes. And the way we measure the speed of an enzyme is initial velocity equals maximum velocity multiplied by concentration of substrate divided by Km plus S. So Km is the Michaelis constant. And it's the amount of substrate you need to go to one half your maximum velocity. Yeah, so that's the equation we're gonna be using here to know based on how much substrate we have, how fast does my uh, enzyme work? That's basically what the michaelis menten equation says. And like I said, if your Km and your S are the same, the current speed you're going is one half your maximum velocity. The lower your Km is, then you can, exp you can go your maximum speed. So that's what I mean by catalytic efficiency. You can get to your Vmax, your maximum speed, at low substrate concentrations. So the lower the Km is, the easier it is to go fast. The higher the Km is, the harder it is to go fast. And there's another term called Kcat, which we call turnover number. That is, at a specific active site in my enzyme, how many reactions can I do per unit of time? And Kcat is your maximum speed 
divided by total enzyme. That is, in a reaction, when you're doing this inside of a lab, you add a certain concentration of enzyme. And you should know how much you add. So that's where ET comes from, enzyme total. How much enzyme did I add to my test tube? And you take your maximum velocity of your enzyme divided by that to get your catalytic efficiency, your turnover number. Or sorry, just your turnover number. Uh, catalytic efficiency is how good your enzyme is. This is KCAT divided by KM. And if your enzyme has a catalytic efficiency of times 10 to the eighth or 10 times 10 to the nine, this means that your enzyme is diffusion controlled limited. What diffusion controlled limited means is that the slowest step of the reaction is diffusion of substrate to enzyme. What that means is if your enzyme is diffusion limited, your enzyme works so fast, the slow step of your whole mechanism is the time it takes for your substrate to diffuse your enzyme or your substrate to find your enzyme. Because once your substrate comes into contact with your enzyme, the reaction is basically and instantaneous, happens so fast, it really can't be measured. Turnover is um, how many times you can do a reaction at the same active site per like second or per minute, depending on what you um, measure it in. Right, so like I can assemble a thousand blocks a minute so my turnover number would be a thousand. I can do 50,000 reactions in a second. So my turnover number is 50,000. And it's just Vmax divided by enzyme total. All right. So there is a graph down here and it's a little bit cut off. So um, I'm gonna redraw it actually up there. Um, so this is velocity and this is amount of substrate. So velocity on the Y, substrate on the X. And let's say up here is your maximum velocity, right? So that's my maximum velocity. And let's say that my enzyme has a curve like this, right? So remember, this is as I add substrate, my velocity goes up. To find your KM, and I'm going to give this number 0 0.5 and 1. Let's say my maximum velocity is just 1, a unitless 1. To find KM, and I'm also going to give this number 0 0.1, 0 0.5, and 1. To find your Michaelis constant on a graph, what you do is you go to one half V max. So if my V max is one, one half of V max is 0.5. So you go one half V max and you draw a straight line until you hit your reaction curve. Once you hit that curve, you drop down to your X axis. Whatever value of substrate you have on the x-axis, this is your Km. So here, your Km is like 0.4. Actually, it's probably closer to 0.45. So to find your Km graphically, you go to whatever speed is one half your K max or your V max. Draw a line on your graph till you hit your curve and then drop it down to the x axis. Right, so that, that's a lot of information right there. Um, questions 
and give you a minute to digest that. But questions about like that information that I covered um, right there. All right, I do have a question. So can I elaborate where I said 0.5 till I hit the line? So what I'm trying to figure out on that graph is KM, right? KM is the amount of substrate you need to um, add to your reaction to go to one half your maximum speed, right? So if my maximum speed is one, one half of my maximum speed is 0.5. To find out how much substrate I need to add to go 0.5, I just draw a line till I hit the curve and then drop down. Yep. All right, so I know it's past time, but I'm just gonna do these two questions. So if you have to go, um, feel free to uh, watch this later on YouTube. Um, but I'm gonna go over these real quick. So estimate KM based on this table. So substrate and we have velocity. So if we remember from our def definitions, KM is the substrate, concentration of substrate where we're one half V max. So the first thing you should do on this table is look for V max, right? And so V max here, I would say is roughly 1200. And you look, and the reason I'm saying that is look at our substrate here. We're going from 50 to 500 to 5,000. So on these three rows, we increased our substrate by 10X each time. However, when we do that, our velocity is like not changing. Our velocity is like remaining the same, which means we're probably at our maximum speed, which is like 1200 millimolar per second. Yeah, so what you need to find is how much substrate does it take to go to 600? Which would be somewhere between three and five. So, you know, roughly KM is four. Does that make sense for people? All right, I have one more problem that I'm gonna do really quick and I'll let go. And it's the same idea. And so do I, how did you get about 1200? Because if you look on this graph, when you keep adding substrate, the speed doesn't change. So I went from 50 millimolars of substrate to 5,000 and the speed like never changed. So I said my maximum velocity is like 1200. It's like an educated guess. So I know this graph's cut off. It's the same idea. I want you to find uh, B max by our uh, KM by looking at the graph. So what is KM? I'm gonna give you, for those of you who stick around, I'm gonna give you a minute to do that. 
and then I'll go over the answer really quick and then I'll let you go. This is the last problem. problem. About 1.2, about 1.5. So let's take a look. So Vmax, I would say, is roughly five. Personally, I would not say four because, um, as we saw in the last problem, we need to add a lot of substrate to, to find our maximum velocity. We haven't done that yet. So I'm going to assume this curve keeps going up, 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 and up. If you said Vmax is four, um, I don't fault you for that, um, but the logic is that, you know, we don't know what Vmax is until we completely saturate, and this curve is probably still going up. So I'm going to say it's five, so 2.5, go there, drop down to like right there. Um, if I did my curve right, that's a little less than one, like 0.8. If you said Vmax was six and went to three, I would buy that. If you said, you know, Vmax could be six, sure. One point two. I mean, I don't draw a straight line, so if we say roughly about one ish, that would be fine to me. But yeah, so again, what you do for a curve, you find Vmax, which I said was five. You go to one half Vmax, which here is 2.5. Draw a line, hit the curve, drop down to the x-axis, read off that substrate. All right, so I went incredibly light today, but um, that's all I have for you. Uh, next week, Monday, is going to be our last lecture. Um, so there's just, a, so I have a few things to get to here. Um, okay, so yeah, so on Monday is going to be our last lecture, then we have our test on Wednesday. So what I will probably do um, is that I will, um, I might just make a new slide for Monday, like I already put one up, but I might change stuff to like knock off some questions to speed up some stuff. Um, but I'll make a homework. Um, and I'll tell you exactly what is, what is and what isn't on test four. Um, so you know where to study. And I'll, I'll probably do that for you like on Tuesday. So let me think about it. I'll tell you exactly where to stop for test four. Otherwise, uh, sure, you can. Um, but otherwise, um, I will see everybody later. All right. Take care, everybody. Make oh, yeah, I'll put up homework as well for this week. But take care, everybody. Have a good break, and I'll see everybody later.